Welcome to today's briefing to release the results of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, 2009 science results for grades 4, 8, and 12. I am Sister Mary Frances Tamens, a member of the National Assessment Governing Board, and will be your moderator. The Governing Board is an independent, bipartisan board that sets policy for the National Assessment of Educational Progress, also called NAEP. The assessment results are reported to the country as the nation's report card. The National Assessment Governing Board, known as NAGB, is pleased to host today's event. As most of you know, NAEP is the only ongoing nationally representative assessment of student performance in the United States. So today's science results are both of import and interest. Before we begin the data presentation, Harv Gilcrest, our webinar producer, will address the logistics and mechanics for using WebEx. But first, I would like to run through our agenda. After Harv makes sure we are WebEx savvy, Dr. Jack Buckley, Commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics, will present the Science 2009 assessment results. Then Dr. Alan Friedman will offer his perspective and his ideas on the importance that should be placed on science achievement. Dr. Friedman is a fellow member of the Governing Board and currently serves as a museum development and science communications consultant. Dr. Friedman will be joining us from New York. Next, we will be pleased to welcome Dr. Bruce Alberts, Editor-in-Chief of Science Magazine to share his response to the science assessment. Dr. Alberts will be joining us from Hawaii, where the sun has yet to rise. Finally, I will use the prerogative of the moderator to share my perspective as a former science teacher and one very focused on secondary education. We will conclude with time for questions during the webinar and off-air at its completion. The first part Please share with us what the attendees need to know. Thank you, Sister Mary Francis. Hello and welcome, everyone. All participants are in a listen-only mode today. However, we do offer a vehicle for you to submit your questions online. To do so, if you'll notice in the lower right corner of your screen, there is a floating toolbar. If you click on the question mark icon, this will open the Q&A panel where you can type your question into the space. It's provided at the bottom. There's also a send to drop down on the Q&A panel. By default, that is set to all panelists. Please leave that as the default because our panelists will convene on the questions and, um, and we'll answer those after the presentation. So again, please leave the Q&A send to window at the default, all panelists. Also, you can submit your technical questions there as well. If you're having some technical issues, please send them there. I have noticed that there are a few folks that I see multiple instances of you joined online today. So you may be hearing an echo effect. So you're having two separate audio streams. Um, if that is the case, go to your browser, close down one of the WebEx event managers, and that should solve that problem. Also, for any other technical issues, I have a tech support number for you for WebEx, and that is 866-229-3239. Once again, WebEx technical support is 866-229-3239. If you have difficulty with the audio and it's, the stream stops on you, you can see the, the audio broadcast panel there. You can use the buttons there just to stop and restart the stream. That should fix any audio issues. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I'll now send the call back over to Sister Mary Francis. Thank you, Harv. Thank you, Harv. Let us begin. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Buckley. Dr. Buckley is the newly confirmed commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics. Um, 
Johnson as a professor of applied statistics at NYU. He is known for his research on school choice, particularly charter schools, and on statistical methods for public policy. Dr. Buckley, congratulations on your appointment as commissioner, and thank you for being here. We are all looking forward. Thank you, Sister Mary Francis. Hey, good morning. I'm here today to share with you the results of the 2009 Science Report Card. Students were assessed at the 4th, 8th, and 12th grades. Over 156,000 students at grade 4, 151,000 at grade 8, and 11,000 at grade 12 took the assessment. We have national results for public and private school students at all three grades. At grades 4 and 8, we also have results for public school students in 46 states and the Department of Defense schools. The state samples were combined and augmented with sample students from the four non-participating states plus the District of Columbia for the national sample of private school students to create the full national samples for grades 4 and 8. The 12th grade sample is smaller because there are no state representative samples at that grade. The 2009 assessment was based on a new framework which emphasized four science practices, identifying science principles, using science principles, using scientific inquiry, and using technological design that describe how students use their scientific knowledge by measuring what they are able to do with the science content. The framework also provided an increased focus on the understanding of science principles and asked students to answer questions that cut across the three science content areas. At grades 8 and 12, there was a shift in emphasis in the content areas. The three content areas for the science assessment are science, life science, and earth and space sciences. At grade four, the assessment placed equal emphasis on all three content areas as it did in 2005. At grade eight, we increased the emphasis on earth and space sciences and decreased the emphasis on life science. And at grade 12, we increased the emphasis on physical and life sciences and decreased the emphasis on earth and space science. We have national results for public and private school students at and at grades four and eight, we also have state results for the plus the Department of Defense schools that agreed to participate. These state results are for public school students only. Results are reported in two ways, as average scale scores on the zero to 300 point scale with a separate scale for each grade, and as percentages of students at or above the three achievement levels, basic, proficient, and advanced. The achievement levels were developed by the National Assessment Governing Board. They set standards for what students should know and be able to do. For each subject and for each grade, the governing board has established standards for basic, proficient, and advanced performance. Ultimately, the goal is to have all students performing at or above the proficient level. The science framework represents a substantial change from the previous science framework. Results from the 2009 science assessment cannot be compared to those from previous assessments. So let's begin by examining student performance at grade four. 72% of students are above basic, which includes students at the basic, proficient, and advanced levels. 34% scored at or above proficient, and 1% scored in the advanced range. The average scale score for fourth graders was set at 150 on a 0 to 300 point scale to serve as a reference point for current and future assessments, as shown by the red bar. This graph also shows the scale scores for all racial ethnic groups. The average score for white students, 163 points, was higher than the average for any of the other groups. To the left of the bars, you see the percentages of all fourth graders in each racial ethnic group. For example, white students constituted 56% of all fourth graders. The average score for male fourth graders in 2009 was 151 points, two points higher than the score for female fourth graders. We have national results for public school students at grade four, along with results for all private school students and separate results for students attending Catholic schools who constitute roughly one half of all private school students. The average scores for all private school students and Catholic school students were higher than the average for public school students. Private school students accounted for 9% of fourth graders. Dave categorizes schools according to location, city, suburb, town, and rural information from the Census Bureau. In 2009, students attending schools had an average score of 142, which was lower than the average score of any of the other three groups. 
NAEP also uses student eligibility for the National School Lunch Program as a measure of family income. Students whose families have an income that is less than 130% of the federal poverty level are eligible for free lunches. Those whose families have an income that is between 135% are eligible for reduced price lunches, while those whose families are above 185% of that level are not eligible. Students who are eligible for free lunches on average score lower than the other two groups. Students eligible for reduced price lunches score lower than the, the not eligible students. About 44% of students are eligible for a free or reduced price lunch. This map compares the average score for each participating state with the national average for students. The 24 states shown in light green had higher average scores than the nation. The 10 states shown in blue had lower scores. The 13 states marked with slanted lines had scores that were not significantly different from the nation. And the four states shown in white plus the district did not participate in the state science assessment. As we saw earlier, white students on average had higher scores than other students. At grade four, we're going to examine the scores and the score gaps for white and Hispanic students. At grade eight, we'll look at the scores and the score gaps for white and black students. This slide will show the states where the white Hispanic gap was smaller than the national gap. As the red bar on top shown here indicates, the national gap was 32 points. White students had an average score of 162, while the Hispanic average was 130. 16 states had a white Hispanic gap that was smaller than the national gap. However, in some cases, the small gap was the result of high-performing Hispanic students. In others, it was the result of low-performing white students. In the five states shown here, Delaware, the Department of Defense Schools, Montana, Virginia, and Wisconsin, both the white and Hispanic students had scores that were higher than their peers nationally. But scores for Hispanic students were high enough to create relatively small gaps. In Virginia, for example, white students had an average score of 172, 10 points above the national average for white students. But Hispanic students had an average of 152, 22 points higher than the national average for Hispanic students, resulting in a 19-point gap. Asterisks indicate scores that were significantly different from the national average scores. In two states, Arkansas and Nevada, the relatively low performance on the part of white students contributed to the narrower gaps. Scores for Hispanic students were comparable to the national average for their peers, while the score for white students was lower. In nine states, the average scores for Hispanic students were above the national average, and scores for white students were either comparable to the national average or below it. The relatively high scores for Hispanic students in these states contributed to the narrower gaps. In one state, Connecticut, the score gap between white and Hispanic students was larger than the gap at the national level. While white students in Connecticut scored above the national average for their peers, the score for Hispanics was comparable to the national average, resulting in the 39-point gap. In the remaining 30 states, the state white Hispanic gaps were comparable to the gap nationally. This slide shows a question or item map for grade four science, with questions from the three science content areas ranked according to difficulty on the zero to 300 point science scale. An item map gives us an idea of the kinds of questions students at different levels of performance can answer. As we move up the item map, increasing the content difficulty, fewer students are able to answer these types of questions. Now we'll look at a single question in each of the four ranges. All four questions are drawn from the physical science content area, showing a progression in difficulty. The question following below basic asks students to identify data on a chart. The question in the basic range asks students to recognize an example of a change in physical state. The question in the proficient range asks students to explain an example of heat. And the question in the advanced range asks students to determine the source of the sound during an investigation about the pitch of sounds. Here's a sample grade four question in the physical science content area, asking students how to determine if two different kinds of cups hold the same volume of water. 35% of students chose the correct answer, C, pour all of the water from cup one into cup two to see if the water completely fills cup two without spilling over. 
The table on the right shows the percentages of students who answered the question correctly, according to achievement level. For example, 23% of students in the below basic range answered the question correctly, compared to 88% in the advanced range. Now we'll review student performance at grade 8. 63% of students performed at or above the basic level at grade 8, while 30% scored at or above proficient. 2% scored in the advanced range. When we make comparisons of student performance at grade 8, we see many of the same results that we saw at grade 4. Because of these similarities, we'll only show you one comparison at grade 8 for male and female students. As the graph indicates, male students scored 4 points higher than female students on average. At grade 8, we ask students to give the level of education attained by each of their parents, and we then classify the students according to the highest level reached by either parent, using the four categories shown on the left. Did not finish high school, graduated from high school, some education after high school, and graduated from college. 7% of students reported that neither parent completed high school, while 49% reported that at least one parent had completed college. Higher levels of parental education were associated with higher scores. This map compares the average score for each participating state to the national average for public school students. The 25 states shown in maroon had higher average scores than the nation. The 15 states shown in blue had lower scores. The 7 states shown with slanted lines had scores that were not significantly different. And again, the four states plus the District of Columbia shown in white did not participate in the state science assessment. As I said earlier, at grade 8, we'll look at performance gaps for white and black students, both at the national and state level. This slide will show the states where the white-black gap was smaller than the white-black national gap, which was 36 points at grade 8, as indicated by the blue bar at the top. We have relatively small gaps in both high-performing and low-performing states. In the Department of Defense schools, the average for black students was high enough to create a relatively small gap. Scores for both groups were higher than the national averages for white and black students. In three states, Hawaii, Nevada, and West Virginia, relatively low scores for white students contributed to the small gaps. In three other states, Delaware, Kentucky, and Oregon, relatively high scores for black students contributed to the small gaps. This figure shows the three states where the state gap was larger than the national gap. In Arkansas, Illinois, and Wisconsin, relatively low scores for black students contributed to large gaps, 43 or 44 points. In the remaining 37 states for which we have data, the state white black gaps were comparable to the gap nationally. This slide shows us the item map for grade 8. Students can and cannot do depending on where students scale. Uh, hello again. Sorry about that. This slide shows us an item map for grade 8. These questions give us an indication of what students can and cannot do depending on where students score on the scale. Here we have a question from each of the four ranges, all drawn from the Earth and Space Sciences content area. The question shown in the below basic range asks students to identify a sequence of formation of Earth features. This question ranked at 140, just below the cut point for the basic achievement level. All students scoring at or above basic will be likely to answer this question correctly. The next question, falling near the bottom of the basic range, asks students to identify the mechanism of a weather pattern. Most students in the basic range and all students in the proficient and advanced ranges will be likely to answer it correctly. The question asking students to list soils in the order of their permeability ranks near the upper boundary of the proficient range. And at the top, at the advanced level, students would be likely to answer correctly a question that asks them to predict the sun's position in the sky. This question is from the Earth and Space Sciences content area, which, as we saw on the last slide, scaled near the top of the proficient range. Students were asked to identify the relative rates at which water would flow through funnels filled with pebbles, fine sand, or coarse sand. 45% chose the correct answer, B. Students had to recognize that water flows more easily through coarse materials. Now we'll review student performance at grade 12. 
Remember, at grade 12, we have national results only. Overall, 60% of students performed at or above the basic level, and 21% performed at or above proficient. The percentage at advanced was 1%. Many of the comparisons of student groups at grade 12 are similar to those at grade 8. To save time, we're only going to focus on one, race ethnicity. As the graph shows, white and Asian Pacific Islander students had higher average scores than students in the other three groups. The five-point difference in scores uh, for white and Asian Pacific Islander students itself was not statistically significant. We also asked grade 12 students what science courses they had completed or were taking. 34% said they were taking or had taken three courses, biology, chemistry, and physics. 38% said biology and chemistry, and 28% said biology only or other science courses. When we bring in the scores for each group, you can see that on average, students who took more science courses had higher scores. However, of course, this doesn't mean that increasing course requirements would guarantee higher scores. Students may take science courses because they do well in the subject rather than doing well because they take more courses. This slide shows the percentages of students who reported taking three different combinations of science courses for the four largest racial ethnic groups, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islander students. As you can see, 58% of Asian Pacific Islander students reported taking all three courses, biology, chemistry, and physics, which was higher than the percentages for white, black, or Hispanic students. Now when we bring in the rest of the bars, showing the percentages for each group that took one or two science courses, white, black, and Hispanic students were most likely to take two science courses, as shown by the blue bars in the center of each group, rather than three. This next slide shows the average scale scores for only those students who reported taking all three science courses. The average for all students who took all three courses was 166, compared to the overall average of 150. Reporters and others asking questions that we'll answer after we finish. So, for all four racial ethnic groups, students who took all three science courses had higher scores than those who did not. However, there were still significant differences in performance among the groups. On average, white and Asian Pacific Islander students had higher scores than black and Hispanic students. This slide shows the item map for grade 12, again giving us a depiction of the kinds of questions that students at various points on the scale can and cannot do. For grade 12, we will highlight individual questions in each range from the life science content area. For example, a question in the below basic range asks students to draw a conclusion about population growth based on data. The question asking students to determine relationships between species based on the evolutionary tree fell near the basic cut point. Again, students scoring at or above basic were likely to answer this question correctly. Students scoring at or above 186 could answer this question correctly, which asked them to evaluate two methods to help control an invasive species. And the final question, asking students to critique a conclusion about photosynthesis, was quite difficult. Only students scoring at or above 269 would be likely to receive full credit on a question of this difficulty. Now we'll look at this particular question in more detail. This question, again drawn from the life science content area, ask students to consider an experiment involving the growth patterns of aerobic bacteria in the vicinity of a strand of algae capable of photosynthesis after light rays of varying colors were passed through the algae. In case you can't see the second illustration clearly, few bacteria are found in the center, which is the area of the light spectrum associated with green light. To understand the significance of this phenomenon, students had to know that aerobic bacteria require oxygen to multiply and that plant cells, when using energy from light rays to engage in photosynthesis, release oxygen as a byproduct. Where there are no bacteria, there is no oxygen. Students were asked whether they thought the results of the experiment justified the conclusion that the algae used in the experiment was green. They were also asked to explain their conclusion using results from the experiment to support their answer. This answer shown here was scored as complete. 1% of students received a complete score on this item. 3% received a score of essential, while 19% received a score of partial, and 71%
received an unsatisfactory or incorrect rating. 6% omitted the question. To receive a score of complete, students had to answer yes. That is, they had to agree with the conclusion that the algae was green. In their answer, they had to explain that green light is not used or is less effective for photosynthesis than other forms of visible light, that few bacteria were found in the region where the algae was exposed to green light, and that this indicated that green light was reflected or not absorbed by the algae. There's much more information on student performance in the science report card for 2009. In addition, the NAEP website gives you extensive information on the performance of students at both the national and state levels for grades 4 and 8, and at the national level for grades 12, along with access to released questions through NAEP's Question Center and access to the NAEP Data Explorer, our online data analysis tool. Later this year, we will be releasing a second science report based on this assessment. In 2009, some students participated in an extended assessment performing hands-on tasks which requires students to use scientific equipment and materials, or interactive computer tasks, which exploit the resources of modern computers to allow students to engage in a variety of forms of scientific investigation and analysis. This second report will give results for student performance on these special tasks at all three grades. In closing, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to all the students and schools who participated in the assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Buckley, and once again, congratulations on your appointment. Now we turn to Dr. Alan Friedman, my colleague on the governing board. Dr. Friedman continues a long career in the science and is a great advocate for elevating and expanding the scientific understanding of our students. For over 20 years, he served as the director and CEO of the New York Hall of Science. He is also known for his distinguished work as the Director of Astronomy and Physics at the Lawrence Hall of Sciences, UC Berkeley. Thank you for being with us today, Alan. Thank you, Sister Mary Francis. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, in part because science has been a key part of my life for a little over half a century. So it's an honor to have an opportunity to discuss the results of the NAEP report card it tells us what our students know and can do at the 4th, 8th, and 12th grade levels in this field of science. You've heard um, from Dr. Buckley the, the, some of the results. Uh, many more are available in the report card, and vastly more are available by going to the website and using the NAEP Data Explorer that will let you ask all kinds of questions. Looking at all of this, what struck me, um, hardest is some dismay at the extremes, at the tiny number of students who are performing at the top level, um, advanced, and the incredibly unfortunate large number of students who are below basic. So let's look at the advanced level, which you can see on this slide. Um, the advanced level, we have only one or two percent of our students. And what does that mean? Um, not everyone is going to score at advanced. Advanced is pretty tough. You have to really be into science. But that only one out of 100 students is into science, that's kind of scary to me. Uh, even at the highest performing states, it's only a handful, maybe four out of 100 students are performing at the advanced level or above. So that is distressing. Even more distressing are the numbers that fall below basic. If you look at this chart um, and see that 72% are at basic or above, by subtraction, 28% are below basic. And basic is pretty simple. It's set of the minimum things you would expect students to know at these grade levels. Uh, you move up to grade 8. And, only, and, and it grows to 37% are scoring below basic. And at grade 12, 40% are scoring below basic. So I find that those two results, the tiny number of kids who are performing at the advanced level, the large and growing percentage that are below the most basic level, uh, these are challenges which I think are very serious for all of us who are into science education and we want our kids to be prepared for 
living a full life. Now, what's some good news is that this really is a great test. It's, I think, the best test we've ever had to measure what we really want to see. And let's take a look at this question, the sneaker test, as a nice example. I think most people still imagine that large-scale assessments like NAEP are all multiple-choice questions, and all they're trying to do is find out if kids have memorized formulas and definitions, names and dates. Well, take a look at this question, an eighth grade question. Uh, a student has designed an experiment, and the kids taking the test are asked to figure out, is there something wrong with this experiment? And if so, how would you fix it? There's no way to have just memorized this. Uh, this particular example, which is now a released item from the test, um, a kid might have come across something similar to it or might not. Even so, how you would analyze what's wrong with it and how you would fix it um, really requires you to think on your feet. So this is the kind of performance item that is much more prevalent in the new test and which I find really tells me something I want to know. Can students think on their feet? Can they look at this example and say, hmm, and come up with something wrong with it and a way to fix it. Uh, the next slide will show you the results on, on this question. And you'll see that about 30% uh, got this completely right. They answered both parts, what was wrong with it and how to fix it. 31% answered at least one of those parts correctly. And 33% couldn't answer either part. Another 6% omitted the question. If we look at how kids did um, achievement level, those who could um, answer this question, those who were below basic, only 11% could get a complete, re offered a complete response. 31% of those students who were at the basic level could, 49% proficient, and 68% in advance. So the question did a good job of discriminating among different levels of performance by students. Well, there's much more to come. The 2009 assessment also included these terrific hands-on tasks and a fascinating set of very compelling and, frankly, fun to do interactive computer tests. And these will provide us vastly more information on how students think. Um, the computer tests, for example, will be able to see how students design an experiment, and how they react to what happens, whether they go back and improve their own experiments. This is real inquiry-level thinking and problem-solving. And when the results of the hands-on tests and the interactive computer tests are released later, we'll be able to see how these complement the pencil and paper items that we've been talking about so far. Ultimately, all of these different kinds of items will appear together on the NAEP scores. Now, the importance of the kinds of questions, you notice that more of them are now in the realm of technology and design. Uh, there is an entirely new framework that the board has developed. It's available free on the web called Technology and Engineering Literacy. So it's an extension of and a complement to the science report. Uh, 2014 will be the first year when it is, uh, and the assessment is performed at the national level at grade 8, and I'm really excited to see the results of that. Okay, so what does all this mean? Um, I think the fact that we have so few students at the top end of our ranking and so many at below the basic is really a problem. Uh, science isn't an isolated trade skill that only a tiny percentage of people will use. The world we live in, everything you're wearing, where you are, the building you're in, the furniture you're sitting on, the air you're breathing, all of this has been changed, and like it or not, will continue to be changed by science and technology. And if as citizens were to have some say in these changes and understand what our options are, then we need to know above a basic level what science and technology are about. 
whether we're deeply into them as a hobby or as a profession or not, just as citizens, we need to know some of this. So why are the scores the way they are with few people at the top and a lot at the bottom? Um, many of the science educators I talk to across the country blame this as an unintended consequence of No Child Left Behind. Uh, you'll remember when No Child Left Behind came in, it said we want to improve performance everywhere, but we'll start by looking at reading and math. And if we don't see performance here, there will be real penalties. Schools might close. Um, other changes might happen. So naturally, people paid a whole lot more attention to reading and to math, and frankly, less attention to science and technology and engineering. And I think some of what we see on this test is a result of that, a lower attention uh, fewer requirements, a lot of students not taking physics at all, or not taking physics and not taking chemistry at all, as we've seen in the data Dr. Buckley showed us. I'm a big believer, though, in uh, looking not just at what's happening uh, in required courses, but what, what happens in those courses and what happens outside of school. And one of the very nice things in the, the NAEP data, which again, not in the report card, but available free on the web, are the background questions. For example, how many times a week do you do hands-on science activity in your classroom? And if you take a look at this data, which is some of the first data being mined from this broader set, the background questions, fourth graders in classrooms that engaged in hands-on science activities once a week or more frequently scored seven points higher than their peers. Eighth and twelfth graders who participate in extracurricular science activities like visiting museums or watching science on television or having a hobby that related to science or technology, they performed in general better than those kids who did not participate in extracurricular science activities. Using these, this background data, uh, we can begin to see, get ideas of how we might improve what's going on. These are correlations, of course. They're not proof of causality. So we have to look at this data carefully. And since it's all up there with the data explorer, we should be able to find out. The difference, by the way, in how much hands-on activity you did uh, varied from state to state. In California, it was 15 points. Students who did more science uh, scored higher than their peers. Okay, well, it's still tempting to assume that most students, once they graduate from high school and go on to college or job training, don't really need science, unless their jobs are specifically in science or technological skill fields. So we think, well, maybe this isn't so bad. But again, I'm concerned not only about the lack of people at the high end who will develop the new vaccines and create the more energy efficient cars. I'm also concerned about all the people who need to understand. Farmers need to understand the impact of the choice to use genetically engineered crops. Um, voters who have candidates who have different views on global climate change, they don't have to be experts in global climate change, but the voters need to at least know what the key questions are and recognize when someone is telling them stuff that's irrelevant or, or simply wrong on the basic science level. So I don't think science is an elective. I think it's essential. Uh, there's a quote I love from Arthur Clarke, uh, the science fiction writer. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And for most of us who don't know what in the world happens in our side, inside a cell phone, uh, a cell phone is a piece of magic. What's wrong with that? What's wrong is that when there are too many things that have been turned over to a tiny elite of magicians, uh, that means we don't have a do-it-yourself society anymore, a democracy. Only if we ensure that our current and future students have the tools to understand this magic and maybe call it science and technology instead of magic, can we make sure we have a vibrant democracy. Thank you, Sister Mary Francis. Appreciate this opportunity to offer my views on what the report card means. Thank you, Alan. 
And now we move and welcome, we move to and welcome Dr. Bruce Albert. We are very fortunate to have such an acclaimed biochemist with us. Before Dr. Alberts became the editor-in-chief of Science Magazine, he served as president of the National Academy of Sciences. He is also a professor emeritus, UC San Francisco, Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics. Good morning and welcome, Dr. Alberts. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, even though I'm in Hawaii, very early in the morning. Uh, I'm an outsider to this process, so I haven't been involved at all. I want to start by congratulating anybody involved for creating a new type of test that will help to drive and access uh, the kind of science education that we need in our schools. Uh, I, I want to start by uh, putting this all in perspective. Uh, what do we want to do with science education? I'll continue the theme that Alan just uh, began. Uh, science education is important for everyone. Uh, first of all, we want to enable every child to have the problem-solving, thinking, and communication skills of scientists uh, so they can be productive and competitive in whatever they do in the world of work. Uh, these skills are uh, the kind of skills that you need to almost deal with modern society in any context today. Secondly, I talk about the scientific temper we want for our nation. The scientific temper means people... Uh, be able to use logic and rationality, having the tolerance uh, for other people's ideas that are inherent to science, listening to what other people say. And uh, this kind of temper is essential for a democratic society. Finally, of course, we want to cast the widest possible net for new scientific knowledge uh, and, and ability uh, and uh, so that we can develop uh, outstanding scientists and engineers. But that's only part of what we're trying to do here. So I have been claiming for years that we have to stop uh, defining science education as we do now and redefine it. Science education is not memorizing the words that scientists use or even memorizing what they've discovered. It's learning how to do science and think like a scientist. I want to give you one example from the kindergarten class, and actually kindergarten class, that shows what five-year-olds can do in a science class. Uh, and a five-year-old could do this kind of thing, can imagine what others can do. Uh, basically, the teacher acts as a coach in, in the kind of teaching, inquiry-based science teaching that we want, in which this exam is beginning to test for. Uh, the, the children go uh, to put on uh, white socks and walk around the neighborhood park or garden. This is every time of year when there are seeds on the ground. And seeds have evolved to stick to animal fur so they could be fenced into distances. And uh, so the fox, when they come back in the classroom, they have black specks on them. Of course, most of the black specks would be dirt, the tips of rock and so on. But some of the specks would be seeds. And the task for the class then, over the course of a week, is trying to figure out which specks are seeds and which are dirt. And the teacher starts by suggesting that they take each speck and put it on a piece of white paper, separate each speck and n number that speck, and then uh, look at each speck with a little plastic microscope, a little $3 plastic microscope you can actually see part of it, and draw a picture of what they see for each numbered speck. And then the whole class discusses uh, how could we figure out which are seeds and which are and eventually a kid will, uh, one of our children will say, well, some of these uh, specks have, have regular shapes, and I think the ones with regular shapes are the, are the seeds. Eventually the teacher works the class so that they knew that's a reasonable idea, and then the class has to come up with a second idea, which is how would we test this? Uh, and again, the teacher doesn't have it in the answer. The teacher, the, 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 she's sort of coaching them to come up with a possible way of testing, and eventually uh, the kids suggest that they could test both the specs that they think are not seeds and the specs which they think are seeds and test their hypothesis. So this is exactly the way the science is done by scientists. Of course, it's a very simple form of science, but this kind of discussion is, is, uh, is a valuable way of, of teaching uh, everyone science. So, so my vision uh, is to have this kind of science education every year of school, 
Uh, as we get older, of course, the challenges like we get harder, and we have uh, curriculum of this type. Uh, actually, the United States is famous for having developed and refined this kind of curriculum, beginning with the post public era. Uh, unfortunately, much of it's used outside of the United States, and we're not using it nearly as much as we should. Uh, I believe that children who've been through this 13 years of problem solving in class and, uh, would be great problem solvers in the workplace. The abilities and can do that that are needed to be competitive in a global economy. But even more important, but be more rational human beings. Uh, because our society is so complicated and confusing, everybody's trying to fool you. Uh, communications, the new communication thing makes things worse. And, and we need people who are able to make wise judgments for their families, for their communities, and their nation, both in what they buy, how they spend their money, how they don't get uh, tricked. And, and how they vote for politicians and how they support uh, people in their communities. So it's too easy to be fooled if you don't think in the way that scientists think. And so I, I, I'm a really uh, a firm believer that this kind of science education is important for everybody. In fact, it's critical. So here's some advantages of meeting the challenge. First, we can retain the curiosity and energy for learning that young children bring to kindergarten through all their years of school. And that I spent a fair amount of time in schools, and I, I love going to kindergartens or second grade. The kids, when you bring magnetic filings or whatever, they're all excited about investigating the world. But you know, the same kids a little later when they're in eighth grade, and most of them have completely turned off from the word science because science is mist and mystified, mystified in my from my point of view, is, is just memorizing words that scientists use. So um, we can, you know, help all of education by keeping education uh, focused on important things about science education. And, and secondly, we could give many more children the chance to excel at something in the classroom. When kids get to uh, kindergarten, they're very unequal in the, the amount of parental background they've been given. Uh, and you know, it's not much fun to always be at the bottom of the reading or math uh, class. But we know that hands-on science can allow kids without the kind of uh, pre-preparation, many of them can excel at hanging up the pendulum or whatever. And this is critical for more and for the rest of the education. And as I said, we need to create a nation of people who could solve problems. Uh, it's, it's critical for our future, for our economic future. And and last but not least, uh, the more I watch television and listen to talk radio uh, in various taxi cabs, uh, I, I realize how much misleading information is out there that need to be distinguished from the true information. And we, uh, this kind of education has to insulate the next generation from all these scams uh, and this uh, ranting and talk radio with simple answers for complex problems. Uh, so, so then, uh, last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we can't do this problem simply with the pre-college teachers. Uh, I've concluded so many days of working on this problem that a major barrier to progress is the kind of science we teach at the college level, and particularly the introductory science courses, which in far too many cases are not using inquiry or not allowing children to, uh, students to really learn the nature of science and appreciation, appreciate how science works. And so science, of course, really sets the tone for the rest of the education system. And so college-level science must change. And that's why uh, actually talks about my current job, which is uh, science magazine editor-in-chief. And uh, this is a great uh, magazine that's widely read by uh, almost all scientists, and so we, we have a captured audience of professors, and I'd hate to have uh, this opportunity to try to make them aware of the kind of issues that we're discussing today, and hopefully uh, we'll get a good response from our, our college friends and uh, help, help to drive the United States to higher achievements in science at all levels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Alberts, we appreciate your remarks. I come to my remarks from the perspective of a former high school chemistry and physics teacher, principal, and assistant superintendent for secondary schools 
and most recently the Executive Director of the Secondary Schools Department of the National Catholic Educational Association. I would like to build on some of the remarks that have already been made and then take a look at a couple other areas. As we consider the importance of science in American education, it's true not in terms of just the what of science education, but also the how and the where this education takes place. This has been addressed by both Alan Friedman and Bruce Albers. We need to go unpack the magic, as Alan mentioned, and I think stock and socks will be going up as a result of Bruce Albert's remarks. But in addition, we need to pay close attention to who has the opportunity to receive a first-rate science education and in what context. As in the past, the assessment does ask and measure a great deal about what American students know in the three main fields of science. You can see that from the release questions that have already been used today as well as the increased number of those available to you. But also it goes beyond that, which comes from the fact we have a new framework. It requires students to do science, to what they know, to apply that, to apply principles, understandings, methodologies, in order to solve real-world problems and design scientific experiments. On this slide, you see an eighth-grade sample of this application. You have two farmers, two plants, and two hypotheses. Students are asked to describe an experiment to test each of those two theories to determine which of the two hypotheses they would support. This goes well beyond a multiple choice item on which our students do fairly well to constructed response. By the time we get to 12th grade, the average percent correct for a constructed response is just 27 percent. There are no trends from this NAEP science assessment because it is a new framework. The new framework and the questions reflect research and the best practices in science education. The release questions and the NAEP achievement levels give us quite a nuanced picture of the areas where student achievement is strong and where performance is lacking. You now see a slide that is a fourth grade, a grade fourth question. It's an example of a basic science literacy question, and students perform quite well, which you see from the percentages on the right. However, this information has to be applied, which is the core of moving to the proficient level and then to the achievement, the proficient achievement level. The performance gets a bit more spotty. Only a third can reach this level in fourth grade. And we are back to the funnel of question that Dr. Buckley referred to in his remarks. The expectations ratchet up as we move to grades 8 and 12 asking students to respond to a greater proportion of proficient level explanations where they answer a question, which we see in the beaker, the next slide, the beaker question. In this question, they're asked to give an answer, explain why that is their answer, and then go beyond that to explain how they know that that is the right answer. You might want to try some of these questions yourself. The portion of students who can design their own investigations, consider alternatives, and perceptively critique an experimental design is quite small. Just 1 to 2 percent reach that advanced achievement level. The results also show us, allow us to compare the overall performance of different demographic groups of students, of those in different types of schools, public and private, and public charter schools, and of public school students in almost all the states. For better or for worse, nearly all of these patterns are pretty much the same as what Nate reported in other subjects, and in most cases for quite a few years. The groups and jurisdictions that have done well in reading and mathematics also generally do well in science. Unfortunately, the converse is also true. The one significant exception is the difference in achievement between male and female students. 
The boys score slightly higher in science in all three grades tested for 8 and 12. And the difference gets slightly wider as students progress through school. Male students are also slightly ahead in math. But in reading, female students are ahead by somewhat larger margins. In comparison of jurisdictions, the one that stands out as particularly high is the Department, the Department of Defense Dependent Schools in 8th grade science. It ties with North Dakota and Montana as the highest scoring in the nation, quite a bit higher than its ranking in math. Although also the black and Hispanic students in defense department schools are particularly strong. These are some of the interesting comparisons in terms of types of schools. In the two grades, four and eight, where samples are satisfactory, students in private schools and those in Catholic schools specifically have higher average scores than public school students. The black and Hispanic students in these schools do particularly well compared to their public school counterparts. White students are also ahead, but by much less than the other groups at eighth grade. As Commissioner Buckley has told you, the NAEP release today not only includes the results of the nation's report card, but also a vast amount of additional detailed data available online through the NAEP Data Explorer. This includes background information on science courses that students take, their attendance and homework, and demographic characteristics. NAEP, as you know, is a survey at one point in time. It does not follow comparable groups of students who have different experiences. Therefore, it should not be used to prove cause and effect relationships. However, it can show associations the factors that for whatever reasons are associated with higher or lower achievement. The profiles it draws can show characteristics of higher scoring and lower scoring groups of students, as has been demonstrated during this presentation. We had some help from NCES and the staff at Educational Testing Service and put together profiles of 12th graders who scored at or above proficient, the top 21% of the class, and the lowest achieving 40% who scored below basic. You see the slide that shows the contrast between the two groups are, and that they are quite striking. Among 12th graders nationwide, 63% of the students at or above proficient, as has been displayed before, have taken biology, chemistry, and physics, compared to just 19% that took all courses among the students who scored below basic. The 46% of proficient 12th graders took an advanced placement science course, compared to 11% of those below basic. 77% are in a college prep academic program, compared to just 39%. 85% say they like science, compared to 51%. 48% read at least 16 pages a night for homework compared to just 21% of the low-scoring students who do not read that much. The demographic differences are also substantial. Alan spoke to the top and the bottom. Among the 12th grade students reaching proficient, 78% are white, 11% Asian Hispanic Islander, and just 10% black or Hispanic. Of the 12th graders below basic, 27% are black and 25% Hispanic, together slightly more than half of all the students below basic. Students from families poor enough to qualify for subsidized school lunch account for 42% of the 12th graders below basic and just 11% of those above proficient. These differences are cause for concern. They show that a great deal more must be done to raise the science achievement of poor and minority students in high school so that substantial numbers from these groups can participate in the work and reward the science careers. Also, more should be done to improve science achievement of girls. Indeed, all students graduating from high school need a strong understanding of the natural world in which they live and of the scientific principles undergirding our society and our life. 
As a nation, we need more scientists to discover new knowledge and strengthen our economy. We need an even larger number of science literate citizens who can understand the many public issues in which science is involved, from global climate change to genetically modified crops to childhood immunization. So coming from my perspective, that is what I would encourage us to consider what we can learn from the results of this 2009 science report, how it relates to the framework, and how we consider who gets the best up, who gets the best opportunities for science education, and should that not be all of our students? Thank you. Now we would like to open for some questions, and to do that, we are going to turn the program over to Amy Buckley, who will moderate that part. Amy? Thank you, Sister Mary Frances, and thank you to all our panelists. For those of you in attendance, you will note we have just passed the one hour mark. Uh, we've had a wonderful discussion, and at this point, we'd like to entertain your questions. All of the panelists have agreed to stay with us, and we are very grateful for their time. In addition to the panelists you just heard, we also have Dr. Peggy Carr, Associate Commissioner with NCES. Dr. Cornelia Orr, Executive Director of the Governing Board, and Dr. Mary Crovo, Deputy Executive Director of the Governing Board, here to answer your questions. So we have a variety of folks that are looking forward to responding. First question for Dr. Buckley or perhaps uh, Dr. Carr. How do the United States scores in science compare with those in other countries? That comes from Grace Merritt with the Hartford Current. Hi. Yeah, good morning. Well, of course, uh, today we're discussing the, the NAEP for the U.S. national scores, uh, but as you know, uh, NCS conducts uh, two other international uh, The PISA is a, a, a test given uh, through the OECD, which has OECD member countries and a variety of partner countries internationally on science, math, and reading, and also the TIMS, which is uh, conducted via the IEA, that's a slightly different country set on science and mathematics. Um, the, the PISA test is the most recently released, which we at NCS released in uh, December. And again, I don't have the scores in front of me, but I would say, and, and again, the PISA population is only 15-year-olds, right? So it doesn't map uh, directly to a grade level as does NAEP. That the U.S. generally uh, scores about the middle of the pack uh, with regards to our, our uh, economic competitors or similarly industrialized nations. Uh, this is Peggy Carr. I would add the uh, most direct way to answer your question uh, will be available to us after we have uh, the results from the 2011 linking study of Nate and Tim. Uh, it will only be, uh, fortunately, just at the eighth grade, but we'll have information about how uh, students in the United States for all um, states actually are participating in the District of Columbia and how they line up against uh, participating um, countries uh, as a result of, uh, of their projected uh, TIM scores. Okay, we'll move to the next question. Amy, are you still on the line? Yes, the next question is from Anita Kutchmar with ABC News. She would like to know, what are the results for students with IEPs, not students with Section 504 plans, and how have those results changed over time? Looking at historical data, students with Section 504 plans were lumped in with students with disabilities on the science tests. So I'm hoping the new data breaks out the students with IEPs. Peggy will take this question, Peggy Carr from NCES, and she's 
looking up some information right now. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, uh, let, let me first say that in uh, 2009, we did not differentiate special needs students who had 504 plans from um, uh, students with disabilities. Uh, but we will be um, uh, bifurcating those data in that fashion with the 2011 report of all, all, all data. Uh, nevertheless, on page 72 of the report, we do have information for our special needs populations um, for the ELL students, the non-ELL students. Uh, there's also uh, information on students with disabilities on page 71 uh, of the report. Uh, and, and again, we have not differentiated the performance of 504 students, but we'll be able to do that uh, in the near future. And, and Great, of course, and of course, because this is the first uh, rendition of the um, uh, we don't, we are excluding. Thank you. Thank you for that additional information. Um, we do not uh, have trend lines for uh, these data as of yet. For eighth grade, we will have that for the 2011 data. Now, on the um, NAEP Data Explorer, uh, you are able to go in and differentiate uh, the data by excluding the 504 students is not um, tallied that way in the report. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, if I just jump, this is Jack uh, Buckley again. To, to clarify, while the, the published report uh, tables do not differentiate between IEP and uh, 504 students, uh, we do have that information available online on the NAEP Data Explorer, so you can you can make that uh, that more fine-grained uh, categorization. Thank you. Amy, we have another question. Yes, the next question is from Pat Winger with Newsweek. Is there any evidence that a larger proportion of high school students are taking biology, chemistry, and physics, or that science curriculums are becoming more rigorous? We're preparing to answer. <laughs> Uh, yes. So, of course, while we can't uh, compare the assessment results over time, we can compare results uh, of the item, you know, the background item where we ask grade 12 science students about their science course taking. And so we see, for example, for the students uh, taking all three, biology, chemistry, and physics, that overall uh, in 2000, 28% of 12th graders nationally uh, were in that category. Again, 28% in 2005, but actually that number had increased in 2009 to 33%. And um, we can further disaggregate that by race, ethnicity, or gender as well. Great. Thank and you very much. I'm sorry, and, and this information is actually on page 50, uh, 50 in the report. Great. The next question is from Stephanie Banchero. Can someone, and this actually might be a great one for Dr. Friedman or another panelist, can someone address the issue of the quality and number of science teachers in elementary and high schools? Do we have enough? Are they properly trained? Please let me know who's responding. Dr. Friedman, would you like to take the question? Okay. I'll give it a try. <laughs> um, this isn't data that we directly have on the uh, in, in the NAEP. Um, there are other um, assessments that are made of teacher quality, and as you may know, teacher assessing teacher quality is not trivial, uh, and there are a lot of political issues around it and discussions going on just about everywhere. Um, there certainly is a great deal of evidence that. Uh, high quality teachers are crucial to the education system. We certainly know anecdotally there are a lot of high quality teachers in the United States. Uh, I think among the issues that come up are even when we have a high quality science teacher who's comfortable with science experience, can use the kind of inquiry uh, methods that the research shows are most effective, as Bruce Alberts mentioned, 
are they teaching science? And where are they teaching it? And how often are they teaching it? And again, for schools which aren't even offering physics, for example, having a great physics teacher who is um, assigned to do something else because physics isn't required, not much happens. So I think we have to look outside the NAEP, though, to look at uh, studies of how many well-prepared teachers in science do we have, where are they, are they uniformly distributed about school, uh, around the different kinds of schools, is some of the differences that we saw between private schools and public schools and parochial schools, uh, performance, is some of that due to, to where the high-quality teachers are. So uh, that... Unfortunately, it's not data that is part of NAEP, but it is data which is being, which is available elsewhere and which is being studied um, by others. Uh, Education Trust comes to mind as a group which has looked at the impact of having high quality teachers for three years in a row compared to uh, not having those. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. Uh, this is Mary Francis. I'd like to add to that. In terms of the quantity, we, we do not have enough uh, people prepared to be science teachers and in the science-related areas. And I think as a profession, beginning at the university level, it's something that we really need to see that this is a valuable career, very important for the individual, for the students who are taught, as well as for the country, and encourage our very strong science students at the collegiate level to seriously consider teaching as part of their career path. And just to jump in quickly also on that last question, uh, again, while not in the report, on the web tool, the MAPE Data Explorer, we do indeed allow you to break down scores by a variety of teacher background uh, variables, including uh, the, the amount of training that the teachers had and, and that, whether or not that training is in subject. <coughs> This is Bruce Alpha. Let me just comment on Bruce here. I think we could always do better. We have a lot of great teachers in our system, as Alan said. They're not well supported in general uh, by school districts. They need they need supplies. They need uh, more than 45 minute periods uh, in, in, to do their science. They need professional development. We have a, a great way to do to go to really take advantage of the talent we do have in schools, and of course. As others have said that in other national reports, we need more science teachers. In fact, uh, right about the gathering storm, a major report from the National Academy of Sciences said that the top priority was to, to recruit and uh, create pro uh, programs for uh, attracting science majors uh, from our colleges and universities to become science teachers. Great. Thank you all so much for your responses. The next question is from Peter Aldis with New Science Magazine, probably a data question for Dr. Buckley or Carr. To what extent are the below average scores recorded for states in the southeast and the southwest correspond to the state's racial demographics, or do white and Asian students also perform poorly in these states? Just one moment while we gather our response. This is a good question. And so, again, all the, uh, the, the tabulations that we presented in the slides earlier, of course, were univariate, right? We were just controlling our cutting on, on one particular category. It, it would also be possible to, to compare uh, you know, within categories. So, for example, uh, in 12th grade in the 2009 uh, assessment, the national public uh, score for white students was 159 on average. In the Midwest, white students also scored 159, the national average. In the Northeast, uh, the average white student scored 162. But in the South, uh, that average was 155, which was significantly uh, lower than the national average. I should point out that those previous two numbers I, I read to you uh, were not statistically significantly different. So white students in the Midwest and Northeast uh, were statistically tied with the national public average, but white students in the South were significantly lower. And white students in the West uh, were also tied. We don't disaggregate, uh, in general, uh, at least in our reporting, at, at a lower level than, than those simple four regions, Midwest, Northeast, South, and West, at the 12th grade. 
the of course at the at the Fort Bank grade you have down to the state level uh, where you could you could look state by state to see whether or not those differences uh, within state were actually different. And and that's again that's an analysis you can do very simply on the NAEP Data Explorer if you want to look within a particular state or a group of states. I'll turn it back to you, Amy. The next question is from Tom Keller. He comments, I thought all states were required by No Child Left Behind to participate in NAEP. How did Nebraska, Kansas, Vermont, and Alaska and D.C. not participate? That requirement, this is Mary Francis, that requirement applies to reading and math. And it's linked to a fourth and eighth grade. And that's on a every other year uh, calendar. It does not apply to the other assessments that are given. There can be various reasons why a state would not participate. It can be that they do not have enough students uh, to participate in this, as well as it would be testing the same students repetitively, that these are students already involved, given the numbers in the reading and math on this every two-year sequence. Uh, that can be one reason. It's a voluntary, other than reading and math, it's a totally voluntary exam for both the state, the school, and the student. Uh, and by the time you get to 12th grade, student, it's a different issue with 12th graders because of their ch choosing to personally opt into that. Thank you very much. The next question, perhaps for Dr. Orr from Ann Lee Jeffs. How can we engage the science practitioners in the workforce to be part of the resource to move the current science student knowledge, which is not good, to a future that's more competitive? Um, this is Cornelia Orr, and um, I can talk about engaging uh, the college and workforce of, in reading and math because the board has a preparedness effort underway to study this issue. And we uh, also have a business policy task force uh, that the board has appointed to help us fine tune our uh, discussion with these employers across the country about uh, all subjects. But for right now, the preparedness research is just being done in connection to uh, reading and math and hopefully we will expand it. But I think sharing these results with the broader audience, we will likely have a webinar uh, which we will invite an, an audience to uh, discuss from the training community that will be sponsored by the Business Policy Task Force uh, to discuss more engagement of workforce uh, in science as a result. And that's one strategy that we are taking as an approach. Also, our board members uh, live all across the country, and they are engaging um, members of their community through uh, op-eds in the paper and through their visitation uh, for local educators. The board also uh, has an outreach event when we are able to uh, meet out of town where we invite local uh, policymakers to come and discuss issues and I suspect that our March board meeting science will be key among the issues that will be discussed at that meeting. So these are a few of the strategies that the board uses to engage the um, field about discussions about science and its relevance for preparing workers of tomorrow. Um, anyone else? Yeah, this is Alan. Can I also comment that uh, scientists and engineers and people with technical skills uh, to a large extent are actually very eager to try and help and they volunteer to go into classrooms and to work with kids outside of school. The difficulties are that they're not always very good at it. Uh, and I've been in a lot of classrooms that see a scientist come in and talk completely above the level of the kids and the teacher and pretty much everyone else except their peers. Some scientists are brilliant at this, some may do more harm than good. So there are a number of programs around the country to try and help scientists understand how they can contribute 
to education for kids in grades uh, K through 12. Uh, I might note one of them, a project called Portal to the Public at the Pacific Science Center in Seattle. That's done wonderful work figuring out uh, what's the minimum amount of time they can spend to bring a scientist up to speed on how to talk to a 12-year-old. Um, and it, it is doable, and they can get very good at it. So programs like this are all around, and the scientific societies, groups like the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, are really eager to do this and are willing to put in a lot of time and effort. So we're learning how, but um, it, it's not so simple as just dragging someone who's employed in science and technology into a classroom and saying, okay, make things better. In San Francisco, uh, we've had at UCSF uh, University, University of California, San Francisco, for more than 20 years, a partnership program that sends 300 to 400 scientists into classrooms as partners with teachers. And I just want to reiterate what Alan says. We don't let them go in without a day of training. Uh, but it is a very successful way, especially when students go in. They, you know, young women, scientists, but uh, it's very amusing to see students challenge them. You're not a scientist. You don't look like a scientist. So, so part of the, the, the um, effort is, of course, to make science go the human face, which is very important for kids to get engaged. Thank you all very much. The next question is for Dr. Buckley from Arthur Eisencraft. Does the data exist to see if a correlation exists between student school attendance and NAEP science score? We, we don't measure uh, the student's attendance at the individual level, but there is a context measure of uh, general levels of absenteeism in each school that was included in the assessment. And so it would be possible using the uh, NAEP Data Explorer tool to, to produce that sort of correlation, yes. Great, thank you. The next question is for Dr. Friedman from Diane Delphin. Dr. Friedman, you mentioned your interest in science learning opportunities outside of school. In what ways do you see or would like to see after school play a role in increasing student interest and achievement in STEM? Oh, thank you. Well, yes, <laughs> because I spent most of my life in out-of-school science learning. Um, I think there's huge potential here. And there are some serious arguments um, that come out of a, uh, last year's National Academy of Science report on learning in informal settings. Uh, an article by uh, John Falk and Lynn Deerking appeared in the uh, most recent issue of American Scientist magazine that argued most people know most of what they know from experiences they had not in classrooms but outside where they spend something like 95% of their lives. So I think there are huge opportunities. The after-school programs uh, in science are a very rapidly growing part of the national picture. Um, the second uh, ever conference of people who are engaged in, in incorporating science and after-school programming took place in Los Angeles a few months ago. Uh, we have some evidence, including uh, what I, some evidence I cited using the background data, uh, and similar evidence from the PISA studies, that participation in out-of-school and after-school uh, activities do correlate with improved test scores. Now, again, correlate, not causality. We haven't proven that yet. Uh, I think a lot is happening and a lot more can happen, um, and the leaders in this are groups like the Coalition for Science After School and then the various people who arrange programming from television stations with shows like Design Squad, uh, that encourages uh, teenagers to look at engineering, to um, to local after-school providers who, who get a classroom and, and bring in some scientists and others to work with kids. A lot is going on, and I'd, I'd like us to see ways to encourage uh, all of these out-of-school activities and help them complement. They're not going to replace what happens in the classroom, but they can provide a really important complement and work for kids for whom the classroom is not working so well. 
Great. Thank you very much. The next question is data related from Pranodi Asher. What percent of 12th graders who are at or above proficient are going to college? And what percent are going to college as science majors? It's a good question. We do have uh, a similar question on the background questionnaire about what the student plans to do immediately following uh, graduation from high school or within the next year after completing high school. Uh, and um, of course, the SEF report, we have no idea if the student will actually do. Perhaps they, they don't either at that point. But we have information uh, on the student's performance and how they respond to that question. And again, that NAEP data tool, as, uh, as Alan pointed out, is a rich source for uh, examining those types of relationships. So I, I suggest that you go there for your answer. Great. Thank you, Dr. Carr. And unfortunately, we've arrived at our last question. If we have not been able to get to your question during our event, we will be following up with you directly during email. Our last question is from Bill Bertrand. With the data showing that an increase in hands-on teaching resulted in higher scoring, would you recommend that the use of labs in school increase? If so, what restrictions, if any, should be placed on the student-to-teacher ratio? Alan, would you be able to take that question? Sure, I'd, I'd like to I'd give that a, a shot. Um, first, as Bruce Alberts mentioned, we have a lot of data besides the NAEP data suggesting that inquiry learning methods, which usually involve hands-on activities, um, are effective. And the uh, correlations that we can look at with the NAEP data and the PISA data strongly support this. So how do we actually go about doing it? An interesting thing is that the notion of a laboratory, a dedicated room with a lot of expensive special equipment, with sort of the traditional way to do activities, um, is no longer the only way. Uh, the, um, the commercial sector in the U.S. has been quite wonderful in producing new kinds of simple, low-cost, portable technologies. Some of these, for example, are called probeware that allow kids to have sort of a laboratory with a laptop computer or even a smartphone, uh, probes that you can plug in that allow it to, to measure temperature and speed and light levels and sound. So the ability to do activities doesn't always require a full-blown laboratory. It can be a kit, sometimes even a very simple kit, like the $3 microscope that Dr. Alberts mentioned. The major thing, I think, is not the physical resources, although certainly if a teacher has a budget of 50 cents a year per kid, she's not going to be able to buy a whole lot of even rubber bands and string. Um, but beyond that level, there's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of very good hands-on materials that are not always very expensive. The catch is teachers understanding how to use these and being comfortable with them. And here we have to rely on groups like the National Science Teachers Association that really does the, the, the bulk of the effort to identify good materials and activities, show how they can be used not in a cookbook fashion but in a true inquiry mode, and help teachers get comfortable with using these. What do you do when kids get stuck? Um, what do you do when some kids finish real fast? Um, what you do when their interpretations aren't the conventional interpretations? How do you work with what they're doing? Uh, we know how to do this, uh, uh, not perfectly, but very well. And again, groups like NSTA, some of the teachers' unions, have been doing uh, yeoman's work in helping all teachers, new teachers and experienced ones, learn how to use activities effectively. So, yes, I'm a firm believer in these. Um, I think we have the tools we need. We just need um, time for the teachers to learn how to use them effectively, to help each other learn how to improve uh, the use of the materials, 
And then, as Bruce mentioned, they need time to actually do these activities. If, if the number of hours they can do science is strictly limited, uh, or severely limited, I guess I should say, no matter how many good activities they know how to do, they're not going to have time to use them. So it's a matter of everybody involved in setting up the resources for science education, saying, okay, we've got to provide enough time, and we've got to provide the teachers with the ability to, if they don't already know, the ability to learn how to use activities wisely. Uh, Mr. Bruce, let me just uh, tell everybody in case you don't know that the advanced placement courses are being extensively revised in response to an earlier uh, report from the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, the first online will be the new biology AP exam. Uh, it requires, it involves a lot of inquiry. Uh, I think it's going to come online in 2012 or maybe 2013, but it's going to support this kind of uh, teaching that we've been all emphasizing. And, and the important, an important lesson learned from them as relevant as this question is that uh, conferences of AP teachers, which are, of course, some of our best teachers, we discovered, we, uh, the, I guess the National uh, Association of Science Teachers, uh, NFPA, discovered that most of them felt uncomfortable teaching inquiry science because in their college courses they hadn't experienced any inquiry themselves. So uh, the, the two big lessons from that, first of all, as the college board recognizes now, a massive amount of professional development of AP teachers is going to be needed to make this new teaching effective because you just can't walk in and do it. You have to experience some of this uh, firsthand before you could teach uh, as a coach in the inquiry mode. Uh, and, and second of all, it gets back to my point of changing college teaching. We, if we don't make uh, allow all students to experience inquiry in first year college biology, which we don't do now, and of course, we always have to make up uh, uh, this professional development of what our teachers have to learn in order to teach inquiry. So there's a huge effort here, and I think we have a great opportunity right now because of these confluence of forces, the new AP exam, the push from the science and math teachers, the, this, this uh, wonderful new exam, uh, or local exam, all, all are pushing in the same way, and uh, hopefully we can make a real difference in the next five or ten years. Amy, we would like to thank you for uh, facilitating and moderating our question session. We've run into a, we would say, a good problem. We have approximately 300 people who participated in the webinar, and the questions are still flowing. I'm going to invite Peggy Carr to share with you some information about a follow-up session with a slightly different emphasis that will occur this afternoon that may help many of you with your questions. At 2 o'clock today, we have what we called a stat chat. There's a live uh, stat chat where we answer questions in real time. Uh, you can submit, start submitting your questions now. Uh, in uh, many cases, these questions that have been uh, um, asked today and we were not able to uh, answer will probably come up again, or you are certainly welcome to resubmit them and get them answered uh, in real time this afternoon. To attend that session, simply go to the Nations Report Cards uh, website, and you'll find the appropriate information there. Thank you, Peggy. Also, at that same website, you will find not just the report, but a number of tools that you can use to access more information, sample questions, and other resources. Particularly, the framework is, I think, will be of great interest to you. Secondly, an archived version of this webinar will be available tomorrow at nagby.org slash science2009. Please direct your other interested colleagues to this site. Many of the questions that were brought up are questions for the larger community of science educators and science-related associations. We encourage you to engage people in probing those. Also, the remarks and the bios of today's speakers, the science framework, and other materials can be downloaded from the NAGD site. Sir, we appreciate your taking time to answer a very brief survey that will pop up in your window when we end the session. The responses really are a great help to us. Then we invite you to stay tuned. There will be an announcement of a 
the forthcoming announcement on the date that we will release the results of the trial urban district assessment grades four and nine that were part of this 2009 science report card. This release will provide data from the 17 urban districts that participated. In closing, I would like to thank Dr. Bruce Albert, Dr. Jack Buckley, and Dr. Alan Friedman for being with us today to elaborate on the results of the 2009 science report card. And to you, our participant audience, we thank you also for